Yeah, so hi, I'm, I'm Dorothy, and I'm here to talk about eco-theology. I'm so glad to have been invited. Today is just eco-feminism, so part one of three. We're also going to be doing animals and religion and Christianity and climate change. So I really hope you guys will talk to me and <laughs> ask me questions, because I only have 14 slides. <laughs> There's not much on them. So I, I really just sort of want to have a conversation about this. I don't know. I know some of you have extensive backgrounds in religious studies. I don't know where anyone else is coming from. So I, uh, I'm going to assume you'll ask if you, if you uh, want to ask something. Okay, so let's go. All right, so these are the three things that I'm talking about, ecofeminist theology, theology of animals, and Christianity and the climate crisis. This is not all there is to eco-theology, obviously. There is... There's a lot more. There are lots of different takes. There's sort of more uh, Bible-based evangelical eco-theology. I mean, there's the political theories of eco-theology. So this is just stuff that I personally am interested in. I'm teaching classes on, I'm writing articles about. So uh, I thought I would share that with you. Okay. So here's a picture I have. This, I do have a location. Uh, Bairnsdale, Victoria, Australia, <coughs> late 2019. I'm sure you guys remember all the fires. It's hard to keep them all straight because there are fires and then more fires and then fires here. So, um, <clears throat> and I have a quote. So I'm going to be talking about Rosemary Radford Ruther today, and I'll give you some more information on her in a second. Has anyone heard of Rosemary Radford Ruther? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. So, does anyone want to read this quote for me so you can get it right to my voice? Yes. It is only as the crisis of human civilization, civilization appears in our own time with climate change that we become acutely aware of the need to fundamentally change the way we think about our relationship to nature and in the process, our relation to each other as classes, races, and genders. Yes, thank you. And so this was just a quote I took from like an unpublished paper of Ruther's, but it kind of sums up what she's doing in all of her work. And it also sums up to me the point of ecofeminist theology. I mean, she's being intersectional with classism and racism as well. But the idea is this, this stuff, these fires, what's happening, the, the indifference that leads to these things continuing to happen and no changes being made is connected to a system of domination that you also see in sexism, in racism, in classism. So we're focusing on the sexism aspect of that right now. Okay. So here we go, this is my, my busy slide. So here's Ruther, one of the founders of ecofeminist theology. This is the, I believe, one of the original covers of her Sexism and God talk yeah. from 1983. It's the one that I have and I just, I, I love it. It's very, <laughs> it's very early 80s kind of cover. Um, so she is Catholic. One of my other favorite uh, Ecofeminist is Sally McFaig, who is Presbyterian. Uh, her work involves more models and metaphors, and if there's time afterwards, we could, I mean, Dan could just stand up and talk about it and actually work with her in person. But uh, Ruther, I like because she, I don't know, I feel like she provides a good introduction uh, to the topic. Okay, so Ruther is also what you would call a reformer rather than a revolutionary. You might also call her a reconstructionist. So. Does anyone know the difference between reformers and revolutionaries in when it comes to like critics of religion, especially feminist theologians? I'd like to learn. Yes, well, great. Okay. <laughs> well, sort of as the, as the words imply, a, a revolutionary is someone like a Catholic feminist theologian Mary Daly, who starts out as a Catholic, as you know, and and starts criticizing the tradition, and ultimately comes to the view that. Patriarchy, you know, the rule of the father, sexism, is not just an addition to that faith tradition, but is intrinsic to it. That you can't have the tradition without the sexism, and therefore you have to jettison the tradition altogether. Just hmm. burn it to the ground, start over. Revolution, right? right? Reformers believe that the core of the Christian message is the flourishing of all people, life-giving, egalitarian, lifting people up, and so that Anything that's not contributing to that ultimate purpose isn't actually the word of God. It's the word of man, you know, being imposed on holy scriptures or interpretations of scripture. And um, therefore, we can edit, basically edit our theology, create something new that's actually more true to the real Christian message. So Ruther is one of those. Uh, although, just like with, you know, 
lots of areas. I'm sure there are plenty of Catholics who would be like, she's not a real Catholic. Yeah, that's what I, was, I was wondering, this seems very odd. Like, being ca ca like Catholic like, is so steeped in tradition. Yes. And that's not her, I guess, maybe. And yet some of our best eco-feminists are Catholic. I'm thinking also of Elizabeth Johnson, hmm. um, who wrote, I mean, she wrote the classic She Who Is, where she uses the tradition. She goes all the way back to all the church fathers to justify more female language for God. And I, and this may be apocryphal, but I heard that they pulled her in front of a, like a tribunal or a council, a magisterium, something like that, in the church to be like, oh, this stuff you're writing is wrong. And she was just like, no, man. And she, like, with a quite a scholar, just, <laughs> she, they couldn't fault her. She had it all. It was all in the tradition. So a case can be made that even within these traditions, the idea of uh, the essential superiority of men over women is not, it, it, it's not justifiable based on foundational Christian doctrine, according to our reformers. Of course, Mary Daly would just say, no, no, it's all, it's all got to go. Okay, so Ruther, Ruther, so this whole book was primarily trying to get into the issue of sexism, as, as the title implies, in theology, but she has a chapter that I'm going to be referencing a few times here that talks about the relationship to nature, and in this book, it seemed more, more like an afterthought Oh, by the way, this is also something. And then she slowly started developing it more and more. And she's, she's appeared in so many books. She writes, anytime there's an edited volume on feminist theology or eco-feminist theology, she's often the one who wrote the foreword or the introduction. So she's someone to know. Okay. So Woman, Body, and Nature, Sexism and the Theology of Creation, that's the name of the, title, of the chapter from her book that I'm going to be talking about. I'm sure you guys can recognize what's happening here. <laughs> And you want to extemporize on what, what you're seeing. It's an interpretation of the fall of humanity. Yeah, right. Eve's, and his uh, interaction with the serpent and uh, yeah. Yeah, she's she's eating the apple. She's picking some more apples. Adam's like, all right, I'll eat it. Yeah. So there's a cow just sort of staring at you. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting like, animal choices. Yeah, there. This is more animals in yeah. it than I'm used to see in. The, the macaw uh, is kind of really yeah. interesting. The parrot. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Is that a goat on the far bottom left? It, With a lot of leaves around it. Yeah. yeah, it could be. I, you know, I, I can't quite tell. I'd like to look into this. I can't remember. <laughs> this is another one where I think I forgot to uh, attribute it. And half the time when I do attribute my pictures, I'm just like, why did I even bother? Nobody cares. <laughs> Especially with the college students. Like, oh, dang it, I need to have detailed reference. We love looking at photos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this group likes that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Huh. All right. So, and this is like totally off. It's really boring slide. Um, but I, it just gives me the words <laughs> that I want to talk about. So main point, main point. So if this were like a real class, I would have had you read this chapter already and then it would be me like, trying to help you work through it. So the main point is that there is this important connection between the domination of women and the domination of nature and you can't deal with one without dealing with the other, uh, which is sort of what I've already said. So does anybody else who hasn't had a chance to read yet want to read this bit? Give a break from my voice. I'm sitting up close. Okay. Do you want me to just do the yellow or down? Uh, just this. Okay. The... Any ecological ethic must always take into account the structures of social domination and exploitation that mediate domination of nature, and prevent concern for the welfare of the whole community in favor of the immediate advantage of the dominant class, race, and sex. An ecological ethic must always be an ethic of eco-justice that recognizes the interconnection of social domination and domination of nature. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, so what does that mean? What's going on here? Again, I'm sort of repeating the, the same main idea because it's so important. I want to make sure everyone has this takeaway. So for one thing, I want to say, even though second wave feminists of the 80s and 90s were have rightly been criticized for not being intersectional, intersectional enough, they've been there were too many middle class white ladies from North America uh, acting as if their experience of womanhood was everyone's experience of womanhood, you know, criticized for that. But I will say, in Ruther's defense, she's been talking about class, race, and sex kind of from the beginning. She always had a sense that it's all of these things. And a, a cynic might say, well, she's just bringing in class and race. But really, she's just talking about sexism. But just to say that 
I subscribe to the theory that none of us, none of us is free until all of us are free, right? And so that as long as there's any kind of hierarchical domination based on these uh, social characteristics, um, the, the, you know, we're not done. Basically, I can't say, well, I'm fine. I'm like, I got a job. I'm a theology professor, a religion professor, I have a theology PhD. So the problem's over and there is no more sexism. And uh, I don't have to worry about anybody else. Like this whole system continues uh, continues to cause problems and cause problems for nature. So what I'm going to do next is go into some of Ruther's explanations of sort of like the history of this. Where did this come from? What's going on specifically in Western Christian thought that has created this situation that continues to reinforce this situation. Okay, so we go all the way back to the Greeks. This is me, this is my terrible graphic, because I couldn't find something, at the time when I made these slides originally, I couldn't find something that uh, adequately expressed this, so I like drew little boxes. And <laughs> <laughs> so just, just, I'm sorry, I apologize. So this is my mathematical, like, do you guys remember math, worth of the equal signs of the three? I mean, like sort of is, a, is roughly equivalent to, or more or less, I don't know, maybe that's only in my mind. I went to school in, in Australia in the 90s, so who knows how math is taught there versus how math is taught here, I have no idea. So the idea is male is to female as humans are to nature. So sort of like those, SA, those old SAT or GRE questions of like, this is to this as what is to this other thing. <laughs> so in other words, you know, we can map it out, we can say just as we see in the relationship of men over women, similarly, humans over nature. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of, in the church, uh, you know, Christ is to the man as the man is to his wife, right? That same kind of how neat and tidy we can order things uh, in this way. Okay. Oh, and this, so just as like a quick aside that I wanted to point out. So we're not saying women are closer to nature. This is related to this slide over here. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not saying women are closer to nature and women are better than men and nature is better than humans and, you know, all of that. There have been some ecofeminists or people who've called themselves ecofeminists way back in the day who would be like, tap into your feminine essence and run naked and menstruating through the trees or, you know, whatever. There's, you know, I, I think most of you are old enough to remember that, that, that sort of type of uh, <laughs> feminism, which has its strengths and weaknesses. But that's not the kind of ecofeminism I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is because of this, because of this way of thinking about things, if we want to do something about nature, we have to do something about how women have been thought of and vice versa. Do you mind if I ask? Um, Please. Uh, are hu humans oh, on the right hand side would include women as well. Wouldn't it be better or more accurate to say the Greeks that male is to female as civilization is to nature or to, to, to civic society is to nature because yeah. of that split. Um, yeah, I, I know in the Greek thought uh, females weren't seen as entirely developed males. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, the so, and, male. But I don't know if they were yeah. I, I'm just think I'm thinking about the um, you know this this contrast here and I'm I guess I'm more comfortable with civilization versus versus yeah. nature. You can well, and I think, or civic society, yeah. And I would agree. I think the problem is talk about culture, nature. Culture, there, there are all yeah. of those dualisms, you know, mind and matter, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spirit and body, mm -hmm. culture, nature, male, female, always with that primary term being defined as not the other term, and the other term is denigrated. I think the reason I originally went with humans here is because for the Greeks, they were thinking of it as humans, because we are the only ones who we... Right. Property owning right. men are the humans. And so it has been then transported into our society now. There still is this, there continues to be in, you know, in Christian thought, in North American thought, this idea of nature is this inert <clears throat> matter that humans have a right to mold and shape as they wish. And, you know, Yes, in the last few decades, a lot of progress has been made with this male over female thing, but you still have these, this sort of sense of some women as not, you know, they're not entirely rational, those hormones, because of course men don't have any hormones. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, so this, this also more accurately uh, represents it. So we have the great chain of being, 
I have searched, and when I have searched, I need to just make my own graphic, but as you've seen, my own graphics are terrible. So right now I still have just this blurry one. I can't find one that's not this blurry. So I have the great chain of being also from Greek thought, but very popular, like in the Elizabethan era from what I have heard. And so you have at the top, you have God, and it goes down. You have heavenly beings, including, you know, demons, just anything sort of supernatural, man, woman, animals, plants, minerals. And so if you want to be saved, as Ruther says, the direction of salvation follows the trajectory of alienation of mind from its own physical support system, objectified as body and matter. So if you want to get closer to God, you want to climb up this, this chain, you have to say, this stuff's worthless. I don't need this. Move away from this because we want to be closer to God, even though you can't exist without these things. You know, and man is born of woman, of course. And so, you know, but we have to deny the stuff that we're standing on top of and say, it's like it's not there. It doesn't matter. I'm going this way. And so her critique is that, you know, we are, we are denying our own life support system so that we can get somewhere else. And I feel like that's really happening right now with climate change and various people in power who just, it's sort of a sense of it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, what's happening to the earth. What's important is this pursuit of these ideals of capitalism, economy, uh, you know, human exceptionalism, all of that stuff. And so <clears throat> she says, all that sustains physical life, sex, eating, reproduction, even sleep, comes to be seen as sustaining the realm of death. And she's referring especially sort of to the monastic uh, way of thinking about things. I have a slide of Frau Welt, which I think might be the next one. Yes, it is good. Okay. And she's just sort of saying there's this way of thinking, if you want to be closer to God, you need to be further away from all of these other things. In other words, you should, you being the man, typically speaking, you should reject this and move closer to God. And so one example she gives of this is Frau Welt. Anyone familiar with Frau Welt? Lady World, in other words, auf Deutsch. Uh, this is the picture that I was able to find of Frau Welt. So I'm not sure if you can tell. So this is supposed to be a comely young maiden. To me, she looks like a 10-year-old, which is disturbing in its own way for other reasons. But let's just say comely young maiden that, that a, a man in you know the medieval renaissance, some period in the past, would have found attractive for some reason. But, and then behind her, what can you see what's going on? Uh, I think it was in this cutaway of her dress. Yeah. Can, you tell can you see into her back? Yeah, it? you're seeing into her back, and it's not just... It's a little blurry, I'm afraid. It's her organs, like organs and guts, but it's also like rotting flesh, disease. Oh, there might be a rat or something. And basically, the idea that it was so twofold. One is the literal desire to sort of train celibate monks to say, like, you look at this woman and you think, oh, she's so sexy and desirable, but you need to think about she's got like, guts and entrails and blood and poop and pus, like, uh, you know, so just think about that when you see her, not her pretty face. And, but then also it's, she's, she's lady world. So it's to help you learn to reject the world as well. You see the world, you think, oh, it's beautiful. Look at these lakes and streams. Look at these cities and magnificent landscapes or whatever. But remember that underneath that pretty surface, it's just death. And if you're too attached to this world, then death is all you're going to get. You know, death, disease, play. And honestly, I've been doing some more reading recently about just you know, some historical fiction of all the all the plagues, like yeah. typhoid and tuberculosis and bubonic plague, all of the stuff. And I'm like, I can, I mean, I can kind of see why you might just yeah. <laughs> reject all that, especially if you're living in <laughs> right. London in 1666 or something. But, uh, what, what are you reading? Oh, the tough actually, honestly, yeah. I'm reading Call the Midwife. You know, they made that oh. the BBC mm -hmm. show and I, I bought I bought the books for my stepdaughter because she's really into all that kind of stuff. And it's referencing, uh, you know, just poor people in the east end of London in the early 1900s <coughs> and just all the horrible stuff that they're living with. It's been going on you know, mm. forever, but especially in these crowded conditions. So I'm like, I can see why you might just say, I'm done, you know, I'm out. So, yeah, so there's this quote here. Women carry in their physical beings the threat of a debased subjugation to corruptibility and death. So... And, and I think if I had a, one of my feisty students in the room, they'd be like, well, we don't think that now. You don't go to church. No one says this. No one's talking about this, so it doesn't matter. But I believe that 
that what Ruther's trying to do is to say that this our tradition is steeped in these values, this idea that just you should reject it, reject the world, and you know, from a male-centric perspective, you also need to reject women, you know, that closer to nature aspect. So and I think you know you can see a lot of this in what's happening with climate change denial or even people who just say, bring it on, let's burn it all up so the you know end times can come. Um, you know, God gave us this world to use, use it up, and then, you know, get to uh, something better. You know, a good example of <clears throat> where we still see this, yeah, I think it's evangelical Christianity. You don't see very many women preaching from the pulpit in some of the more conservative evangelical churches. At the same time, it's those evangelicals that are the highest on the, you know, podium or when, when it comes to Christian nationalism and mm -hmm. Actually, when they talk about nationalism, they're really talking about capitalism. That's what basically mm -hmm. what they're all about. Mm -hmm. uh, look at what Governor Ricketts is doing right now. I mean, with uh, he's bringing there's a conference going on. This maybe you're aware of this. You know, Biden's thirty by thirty. I, I saw a statement by him saying we're going to fight this. We're right, right. So him. Pete Ricketts, though he's not evangelical, he's pretty evangelical Catholic, we mm -hmm. might say, or or. Um, rather conservative Catholic, he's bringing in all of these um, very, very right-wing evangelicals to talk yeah. against this 30 by 30, you know. On an evangelical basis, like this is unchristian in some way? Uh, no, actually, um, one's a politician, the other's, uh, I, no, I think they're all politicians, huh. but you know how the, many politicians are connected with the, the evangelical right. Yeah. Um, but... The fact that, you know, we can go to many of the conservative churches here in town, and I used to ask students this, how many of you have a female uh, pastor? And some of them were just like, no, no, we don't do that, because it says in the Bible that women can't preach, and of course, look what's happening in the Catholic Church, right? How many women are, <laughs> are priests in the Catholic Church? Um, but that connection between you know that attitude we think oh we're so far past it we're not we're not past it i mean this is genetically deep within us you know? um so i am sorry to interrupt but it just uh, this is brilliant this is excellent please keep going i apologize i need to step away i'll watch the video but thank you very much for being here dorothy and this is right right in the core of what we're trying to teach ourselves as people of faith so thank you very very yeah, much absolutely Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that perspective because I think, yeah, there, there's a sense that, like, well, we don't literally use this picture for you know, Sunday school, so it's not a problem anymore. Yeah. But, yeah, and there, there is, I, in the paper I, I just submitted for publication, um, I reference a song by Christian rocker Lacey Sturm. I don't know if anyone's familiar. Lacey Sturm, uh, she, her album for 2016 is called life screams and honestly i really like it. i just like the aesthetic it sounds great but she has a song her most popular song from the album is called rot and she has a line that says beneath those glowing eyes that call like fire to a moth um it's something like save me from all this beauty that will rot she said yeah. so there's this idea that there's this it's so beautiful and you want it but underneath it's just rot you know it's like well, shining yeah. on the outside <laughs> yeah and and so it's still there. It's still this popular idea. Like, don't let me get attached to this world because I am headed towards something better. Again, the alienation from all the things that support our life and heading. Yeah, this world is not my home. I'm just mm -hmm. passing through. Yeah. You know, that Appalachian hymn, you know. Just, and, oh, and, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I just was agreeing yeah. with Dan when he brought up that point. I would just add, the first thing I thought of with that slide was the Black Death. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's yeah referencing some of that and and again i have which dominated everything and so i can understand i can understand yeah. why you would want to yeah. if you're living in times of plague you know and we're living in these really crowded you know, early urban conditions in europe it would have been awful you want to just leave it behind you know and i just think about all the infant mortality and everything else there's so much yeah. suffering so it's easy to say from a perspective where we have antibiotics and vaccines and electricity and everything else that you know oh nature is wonderful but like it's you know 
So I can understand some of that. At the same time, yeah. uh, you know, this association of women with death, yeah. it also makes sense because you would have seen women giving birth. You would have seen you know, women were the ones taking care of people who had died and washing the bodies. You had this really high infant mortality rate. You know, you had really high uh, maternal mortality rate. So there'd be this sense that women are closer to life and death to a certain extent. So I guess what I'm saying is it's not just coming out of nowhere. You can see where it might be coming from, but that doesn't mean it's yeah, a good idea. Can, I, can I offer a tangent here as well? Yes, I'm saying that I rarely get a chance to talk about this. <laughs> oh, no, I, I appreciate it. Somebody, I who's, like two somebody <laughs> who's, you know, actually studied it. But sure, there's this connection between, you know, decrepitude and women. But look what also happens in our society today when we try to, um, uh, I guess, what's, what would be the right word? Um, uh, it could create a model out for, for women, you know, women... As, as highly, uh, you know, it's almost like the goddess pursuit. What's uh, idealized, the idealized, idealized woman, yeah. right? Mm. Is there a corollary with this where we try to do the same with nature? Okay, think of the Cosmo magazine, you know, the mm. woman's all uh, made up. But we also expect nature uh-huh. in this subjugated way to also be pretty mm-hmm. and to be submissive and all of those kinds uh-huh. of things. I think in terms yes. of national parks for example mm-hmm. uh in in the great smoky mountains national park uh maybe 10 years ago there was a woman that was uh mauled and eaten by a oh, bear wow. right you know and so um big uproar well how in the world could this possibly happen in our parks well, well guess what that's that's what nature is right <laughs> yeah. so they want to you know, we want to eradicate the wolves. We want to turn oh, it yeah. into a nature mall, basically. Yeah. That's precisely what I see happening with the idealized woman. Mm. We are idealizing nature in the same way, right? Yeah, you that's know. a really yeah, we want, good We want them all to be like Snow White. Well, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> we want them all to be Preserve submissive, her. not in any way dangerous. Mm. You know. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or the survey you get with National Geographic, if you're a member, makes me think that they're marketing to see how they can market the magazine. If we put anything horrific on the front cover, will people buy it? Because our idea is to get them to look at cute pandas. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Or, yeah. or any kind of zoo that talks about the real life of the animal, not just the animal in front yeah. of the cage. So that, there's that, that struggle all the time about what people want to see to make them entertained or comfortable mm-hmm. or away from the rest of the world. And only want to have yeah. good stuff in nature. Right. No right. bears. I want, oh, go ahead, Dan. No, go ahead, Will. I've well, talked way too much. This is a little, a little different thought, but I think it's a positive thought. I don't know if you can use this, but I'm still a member of the National Education Association, and I got a notice to Zoom soon after the inauguration mm. with Jill Biden uh, and the presidents of the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers. Three brilliant women. Wow. It was just inspirational. So, I mean, there is, it's, you know, in these times, we have to think of some of the positives too. Oh, I, I agree, and I can. And you'll probably get this. Is that. just me. Like, we've just been staring at the <laughs> cage. <back. laughs> yeah, right. I've been for, for ten minutes here, but oh. yeah, yeah, and you're right. Although, think about it. These these three women are in education, yeah. which is yeah. an acceptable field for for women. Mm-hmm. But yes, any leadership for good uh, point. Yeah, minorities is a good is a good thing or or uh, subjugated groups. Yeah, as, as to your point, Dan. I agree. I, I think that's a really good way to look at it because there is this sense of wanting nature to be beautiful and safe yeah. and let's, let's just stroll through here. I remember reading some stuff about like, would you be okay with a national park or a wilderness that humans are not allowed to go into? Maybe right. you can see like yeah. drone footage, but just let it stay wild, not, oh, look, here's a, you know, a pavilion for you to have a picnic or yeah, just right. leave it alone. But but that, that suggests that humans aren't part of the wilderness, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So like when they tried to move the Native Americans out of Yosemite, like, well, wait a minute now, you want a nature yeah. mall, because mm-hmm. that's humans, they've lived there yeah. forever, right? Yes, those They're humans. part of the landscape. Mm-hmm. And so, I... But, I, but, but, 
capitalist, you know, European humanity, that model of humanity uh -huh. isn't part of this particular nature because all it can do is consume and destroy. Oh, yeah. I've been reading Bark Skins. Has anyone read Bark Skins by any rule? I don't know how to say her name. Oh, P R O U L M. Yes. The pool? I don't know how to pronounce it. Who can pronounce this? Help us. But uh, so, Bark Skin, it's, it's this like 400 year history starting with the first, you know, some French settlers in Canada going all the way to almost the present day. And so it, it traces these two families, but really the, the one sustaining character is the forests of North America. And just how people come and they say, wow, this is huge, you know, this is it's never going to run out but also a sense of just chop it all down as fast as possible. And there are interactions with uh, the Mi'kmaq, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, the Mi'kmaq? Yeah, yeah, the Mi'kmaq. Uh, uh, communities who are just like, we've lived here forever, right. and we we use this part, because they're like, you're not even using it. Like, no, we know where all the medicine is, we know which roots have these things that we need to get to, and a sense of why would you cut down this tree unless you absolutely had to, unless you needed something. And the European model was profit. I look at all these woods, yeah. I don't see beauty, I see, chop it down and, and sell it. And so I've been thinking a lot about that, that sense of, um, yeah. and again, I think you mentioned capitalism as well, oh, yeah. versus nationalism. Yeah. There is there is a sense of turning everything into some kind of commodity. Commodity, that's the word. Yeah. Yes, and, and not seeing something as beautiful in and of itself. And I don't think that's compatible with being in the wilderness. You know, I think you right. have to actually do the, have the give and take. Uh, and one other thing about Cosmo and magazines like that, that obsession with eternal youth and beauty is right. also that denial of death. Like, I don't want to see your sagging skin. I don't want to see your wrinkles or gray hair. Uh -huh. you know, or any of this other stuff. Airbrush it out. Airbrush <laughs> it out. And just don't, we're not even going to take a picture of you if you're over 30. You know, I just, I, because we want to pretend that death never happened. Never yeah. going to come from eternally, you know. And also, we don't want to acknowledge that you have any marks upon your face that suggest you have life experience. That's a whole other, I could rant about that. <laughs> Let me ask this, <laughs> that, that image that you just put on the uh, the Renaissance painting of Adam and Eve, oh, okay. isn't, that a core, isn't that a Cosmo image though? We don't want to see death, we want to airbrush it out, you know. Like, isn't there kind of a, a, a sense that, you know, this is the ideal, we don't, you know, want to see anything and so we've created this myth that at one time death was no mm -hmm. nowhere to be found when in fact it's everywhere to be found it's what our entire our, our entire uh sense of being is is based upon right you know mm -hmm. um i mean this never happened yeah. but it is just so essential to the whole christian tradition and so really it comes down to this fear of death as yes. well and yes. woman equals death, but woman also equals life. It's it's well, craziness. <laughs> you, you know Grace Jansen? Yeah. Her Grace Jansen. So she had, she famously talked about how the Western symbolic, which is a slippery term, what is West? You know, who is West? Oh, right. But but still, there is this sort of uh, dominant uh, Christian Western capitalist ideology, and within that symbolic, it, she says it's it's fundamentally both necrophilic and necrophobic. Oh, and so exactly. necrophobia is the flip side of necrophilia. So on the one hand, it's like just this love of death. Like, get, you know, can't wait till I die and can go to heaven. I can get away from all this. But also, I'm terrified of death. I want to pretend like it never happens. I want to make as much money as I possibly can so I won't die somehow, you know. And also right. causing death, you know, cutting down all the rainforests or killing all of these people. And so she really makes a good case for this, this yeah, necrophilia, necrophobia oh. thing going on. And she advocates instead for of the idea of natality, right? Because all these male philosophers are talking, especially Heidegger, you know, we are being toward death. Everyone, everyone's going to die. And that's true. We are all going to die. But also, we were all born. And so why are we so focused on, like, oh, eventually we're going to die. Let's make it not happen or make it happen sooner. Instead, just like, we were all born. And new people and beings are being born or created all the time. Right. And with that comes a chance for something new. And if exactly. we could value birth, uh, and, and newness over, you know, the end, maybe we could do something, something better. So I'm going to go back to, all right, so enough of this. <laughs> okay, so then, it, this is, so Ruth are in her chapter, she has some sort of genealogy going ancient times to, to now. So she's talking about, well, okay, so you might think, you might think that after, after the Enlightenment, we get into the modern era, we wouldn't have this problem anymore, you know, we're, we're, 
you know, we're rational people and don't believe all these superstitions. And so she says, science exorcises the devils from nature and reclaims nature as a realm of human knowledge and use. So sort of like that idea of you know, these national parks that are beautiful and we can use them, we can control them, we don't have to be afraid of them anymore. And so suddenly, it, it, some people have called this, you know, the death of God where man replaces God. It's like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if there's a God at all or like you're the deists, our founding fathers, you know, just, we don't need to talk about that. So really, functionally, human beings and specifically property owning white males are more or less God on earth. Like we can control things, we can do things, we have this great power and mastery. So, and these are supposed to be animated where I like click and they show up, but for some reason they're all, they're all there at once. So nature has laws that are knowable. We can find out the laws, we can know them, and then by knowing them, we can have mastery over nature. And this word mastery is important, <laughs> mastery, you know. And that relates to those uh, you know, colonialism and slavery and everything yeah. else. And so there's this idea, this is why I have this little graphic of gears and stuff in the background. <laughs> nature is basically a machine and the mind is transcendent over it. I mean, Descartes, or Rene Descartes, the, the computer ergo sum guy, you know, that I think therefore I am, famously was thought animals were basically just machines that moved around, just parts. So it doesn't matter if you do a vivisection on a live animal, you know, because it's not really feeling pain. It's just like a stimulus response kind of thing. And some of this continues to affect. This is one reason why I'm going to be doing animals uh, yeah, and religion, because I think it's something we need to talk about. So in other words, uh, secularism, science did not exactly usher in a new reverence for nature. It just actually made it easier to say, we can control all of this. We can do something. And if you're interested, I can refer you to Carol Merchant and right. some other... Uh, I was going to mention... I'm sorry, I have to mention this. <laughs> but the whole idea of interrogation of nature came out of, as Carol Merchant points out, Woman in Nature, came out of the witch trials in the early... Oh, yeah. 17th century and even prior in the 16th century in Europe where a witch was interrogated and she was, you know, uh, all the sexual, very aggressive, in invasive imagery mm -hmm. was being used to try to wrest from her her secrets. Mm. And it's this, you know, it was pre happening precisely at the time that the scientific revolution was happening where men were trying to wrest from nature her secrets mm -hmm. as well. I was wondering if you were going to talk about Merchant here. Well, I mean, I wasn't, I don't have a slide or anything, but yes, oh, it's her but death this of nature. this is right up her alley, yeah. Yes, precisely. Yeah. And she, she talks about how, you know, in older times, like even medieval Christianity, there was a sense of nature had some kind of life or power. And maybe it's it's deadly and dangerous, but at least it has a, sort of a, a power of its own that we aren't giving to it. And that with the scientific revolution, it was just sort of like nature's just inert, it's dead matter, but we can control it. We don't have to think about it having any kind of agency of its own. Right. We can just do whatever we want. And yes, those witch trials and well, there's a lot going on uh, with the witch trial thing. But yeah, so yeah, I, and I think about how uh, when you, you know all those old tests to find out if someone's a witch or not. Oh, right. And yeah. either you kill her through the test or she and no. You throw her into the pond. And if she drowns, she's innocent. And if she doesn't drown, <laughs> she's then she's a witch and you kill her. So either way, she's going to die. And it's the same thing I think with nature. Right, right. Um, yes, yes. Okay, so, so this is, so we're talking about a lot of negative stuff. What's her actual vision? What's her actual vision that she presents in this chapter? Basically, that matter and spirit don't have to be opposites. And uh, if you're interested in sort of more philosophy about this, I would recommend Val Plumwood's um, Feminism and the Mastery of Nature. His great chapter of dualism, where she just talks about like, the way we put these things into opposition is part of our problem. Matter versus spirit. Never the twain shall meet. So Ruther says we must recognize that human consciousness um, is, is connected somehow to everything in the universe. You know, there's this radial energy radiating out. That's why I have a little image of radiant. Maybe that's God. I don't know. Um, it, there's this energy of matter throughout the universe, and we're just part of that not there's all this inert matter and we have a soul or a consciousness that somehow I just like floating on top of it like oil and water and it's going to be whoop, extracted out and put into the next life. Mm -hmm. And then she draws on Buber to say, uh, Martin Buber, Jewish philosopher saying, we need to respond as I to thou, to the life energy in every being. So in other words, and thou, 
I'm, as I'm sure some of you are aware, you know, it sounds so formal. I remember you know, reading the old translations of the Bible with thou, and I'd be like, well, that's, that's only the way God talks. Like, that's not how anyone else talks. But thou was the informal form of you, right? So you is the plural. That's why we people say y'all now, because yeah. our plural you has been used, and just like with French and German, with, you know, you know do versus z, mm -hmm. or two versus vu. So anyway, so the thou is the two. The, the, the thou is the you and me intimate kind of relationship. So we're supposed to respond as I to that rather than I to it. So a lot of, you know, we go through the world responding to things where I am, I am a subject and this is an object, I it. And I use this thing to achieve some ends. But there's another way of being, which is to be I thou. And hopefully when you have like a human relationship, someone else is like, you know, me and you, and we're both subjects and we're both together. And I acknowledge your intrinsic value and you acknowledge mine. And I'm a different kind of I in that uh, case than if I'm treating you like an object. And that's a whole, we can go down a whole tangent with that. So what she wants us to do is to say, life, you know, all things, all of nature, all people have this intrinsic value. Can we respond to that? And I, since reading Barkskins, which I mentioned before, I really feel like our... Uh, consumerism and capitalism really has a problem with that because you cause it, you have to slow down. If you have to say, do I really need to cut down this tree or slaughter this pig or whatever it is that you're doing? Like, do I need to, or do I just want to? Do I need to, or, or I need to, because I have to you know, increase the profit margin for my corporation. I have to please with my shareholders. Um, we sort of have this aversion to just slowing down and saying, maybe I'll just appreciate this for what it is. And in Mark's hands, I got the impression of the Mi'kmaq people having an eye thou relationship with every tree of the forest. Each one is its own special thing. It's, it's non-fungible. This is ever since I learned about NFTs, those non-fungible tokens, I've been thinking about fungibility. I keep having to Google it. What is fungible? And the yeah. idea that something can be replaced with something else. And capitalism mm -hmm. treats basically everything as fungible. Like this tree, that tree, whatever. This dollar, that dollar, it's still a dollar. It, it doesn't matter. Um, as opposed to saying, you know, like when they move a Native American community, it's like, well, you had this land, now we're going to just put you on that land. What's the difference? You still have land, right? And they would say, no, this land is meaningful. This land specifically, right. uh, like Standing Rock, right? Like it, this, right. don't just say, oh, just give me another, you know, another hill or another mountain. This is the one where our ancestors are buried. This is the one that has a special energy to it, a special power. Um, and it's, it's sort of like, if someone said, I'm going to kill your mother, but don't worry, I'm going to give you another mother. She's also a woman about the same age, looks about the same, right? Why are you complaining about it? Still, you know. And you would say, no, it's this particular person who cannot be replaced. And so if, if we can respond to all of these things as, you know, like this crocus that grows up out of the snow is the only one ever in this particular place at this particular time. Right. And that's special. I mean, that would be a spiritual practice of, or you'd have to really slow down as you, as you, move through the world. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm looking at the time. So this, uh, apologies for the full frontal nudity of the, uh, I guess, Homo erectus there. So this is from New Scientist magazine, this particular cartoon. So all of this connects to this problem of human exceptionalism. And this is, and I see this as like, where are we going from here with ecofeminism? Um, this is my pet project, Human Exceptionalism. I'm trying to develop a theology of human non-exceptionalism, like where we actually say, what does it mean to be, you know, just no more, no less than everything else, every other life form in this world, and then how do we think of ourselves religiously from that standpoint? So this this picture illustrates human exceptionalism, and it's not it's no coincidence that it's some with like some white guy in a business suit uh, at the top. <laughs> the idea is that this is the tree of life. You, know, you have various creatures. I don't know why they are lemurs, because I don't think we're descended from lemurs, but whatever. So you have like lemur, monkey type creatures, uh, various apes, and then, you know, some kind of primitive human on the tree of life, organically growing. And then somehow, humans as we know ourselves today have been kind of just like ratcheted onto the tree of life. Like God right. just said, and now I'm making humans, I have no relation to anything else. You may look like, it may, it may seem like you're descended from all of these other uh, life forms or related to these other life forms, but you're not. 
it's just an illusion. Um, yeah, very mechanical and also gold. Yes, yes. Unless gold, it's brass, but whatever it is, it's it's metal, it's man-made, and, yeah. and he's looking away, right? He's just like, nope, I didn't come from that. I don't have to worry about that. Time for me to go. I don't know. Sell some mine is metal. Yeah. Do you know that line from uh, the Lord of the Rings that uh, Sauron has a mind of metal? A mind of metal. I've forgotten. That. I've made a Lord of the Rings reference earlier, yes. as Grant can attest. <laughs> um, keep it secret. Keep it safe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there is this sense of because we're looking away from all of this, all these other forms of life, we can justify human exceptionalism. We can say, you know, I'm not that, and it, the rules don't apply to me, and Human exceptionalism, the idea that humans are somehow exempt from the laws, rules, consequences, of all other forms of life, you know, any kind of uh, life form that eats up all of its food and then has to starve because there's no more food in its ecosystem, um, and then the population is kind of rebalanced. You know, we think that that doesn't apply to us. That's why we have so much ecological catastrophe happening all the time. Like, that's it's the sense of, like, why shouldn't I just take everything? Don't I deserve it? If I want it, shouldn't I have it? If I can get it, doesn't that mean I have a right to get it? You know, the social Darwinism, might makes right. That's all a Kanye West lyric. It's like, if I want it, I need it. <laughs> right. Well, I just, we just watched Serrano last night. Oh. Or Cyrano, I never know how to pronounce it. You know, the, the new one with yeah, Peter Cyrano. Dinklage and the evil duke sings this song saying, why should I have to beg for what everybody wants? And it's my right. I deserve Basically, if I want it, I deserve it. I ought to have it. Right. And it, that's that kind of that sense of, no, there's no sharing and taking of turns. It's just, you know, you have an obligation almost to make as much money as possible, you know, do all this stuff. So that's something we can talk about more later. But basically to say that ecofeminism, not, <laughs> not cool with this. Okay, this is my last slide. This is, I found this art, um, Wisdom cool. of the Universe. It's acrylic on canvas. I just think it's so beautiful. And so this is just sort of a, a what next. And so this is where I want to hear from you guys or you know, talk about like, where do we go from here? I already kind of mentioned at the beginning, you know, moving away from just focusing on the feminist aspect and thinking more about uh, anti-racism or um, anti-colonialism, decolonial stuff. But yeah, what do you guys think? Where do, where do we go from here? Given we've had this eco-feminist critique, we've had the idea of radial energy and relating to I as I to thou and saying no to human exceptionalism. So now what? Well, uh, I will say there there has been movements in eco womanism. If you're familiar with womanism, the uh, black women's it's like black feminism, but it's not black feminism. It's it was if you're familiar with Alice Walker and the color purple <coughs> and um, so she took it as there was a, some slang that was used in uh, the communities that she grew up in as an African American woman, saying like you're acting womanish, saying to like a girl of 13, like you're acting womanish, like you're like you're something like above your station. She took this term and created womanism as an alternative to white feminism, basically saying it's it's derived from Black women's unique experiences of dual oppression for both race and gender and often class as well. And it's about lifting up the entire community. So it's not just focusing on what do we need as women, but also what do our men, what do the black men around us need so that all of us can be lifted up, but coming honoring the unique experiences of you know, black women and their uh, ancestors over time. So eco-womanism similarly takes that methodology and then really looks at the ecological aspect, which is what Alice Walker was doing originally anyway in the color purple where she talks about, like, I think God's pissed off if you walk through a field, yeah. a beautiful purple field, and you don't pay attention. You know, yeah. God, God would want you to see that. So there, there have been things that happened in the 40 years since that book was, is it almost 40 years? Yeah. Ruther's 39 book. years since Ruther's Sexism and God Talk was published. But I like to refer to that because it kind of lays that foundation. Um, so, yeah, questions? Thoughts? Well, I, I do. I mean, I, do you think we're too far <laughs> gone? I mean, I, uh -huh. I just, I just think this hierarchical uh, way of thinking about the world is just so ingrained in us that it's a disease that can't be overcome. I, you know, be, 
I, I was doing this when Ruther wrote this book, right? You know, a long time. Kind of reached the point where I'm thinking, mm, no. No, and I, 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 I can extrapolate from my experience to how you feel. I mean, I've, I've been caring about this since the early 2000s, so almost 20 years, half the time that you've been working yeah. on it. And I also had this feeling of like, I'm so tired. <laughs> just Right. And, and, and we thought something good was going to happen, and it's just gotten worse and worse. And so I, I understand the pessimism. But I'm at the point now where I embrace Grace Jansen's natality, that idea. I mean, of course, it's not her hands around, not... but, you know, if we, if we give up, then we let the necrophilia win, right? We let uh -huh. this culture of death and destruction win because we're just like, yep, it's all just going to be destroyed. Fine, they can have it. And so I think we need to open ourselves to the possibility of something new entering the world, um, this idea that Every day someone is born, every day something surprising happens. I mean, Greta Thunberg, for example, you have yeah. this new yeah. generation, yeah. Yeah. you have Extinction Rebellion. Mm -hmm. I, I often show my students the clip of Sidney Poitier in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, where he says, mm -hmm. not till every last one of you has laid down and died will you get off our back. And I think of it as like, there's this whole generational ideology that, that just needs to go away. It keeps, seems to live on and on, like a zombie ideology. But I, I just, I do think that there is still a chance for some kind of meaningful change. But I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not as sort of starry-eyed optimistic as I once was. I'm like, oh, it's just obvious. I can see what the problems are. I'm reading mm -hmm. all these people. They seem to see it. So it'll be fine. I think it's a matter of arriving at a new goal. You know, uh, the, the goal back in the 70s was, hey, we're, we're going to change. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're all going to uh, you know, reach this level of sustainability, but that's just not going to happen right now. And, but, but then I, I like what you have to say about natality. What would be, what is a goal that's manageable and at the same time viable? That's where I'm having a hard time. And it's yeah. just a matter for me is just living my own personal ethic. Yeah. And I know it sounds very selfish, but I'm exhausted trying to get anybody else to do it. Oh, I know, I know exactly how you feel. And I would, and I know we were at 10, 15, so I don't know if I... Oh, you know, I, yeah. You need well, to we have 15 here. minutes. We've got, three, we've got three minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yes, yes, it is exhausting. And it, is, it feels hopeless. And I think we need to allow ourselves to grieve, first of all. Not as an mm -hmm. end, but as a transitional point. So I'm I, currently... Couldn't agree more. Yes. Next week, I'm presenting a paper online at Harvard Divinity School about climate grief and this idea of, you know, the sort of spirituality of earth mourning. Like, how can we, we need to say, this is grievable. I am sad. Like, I, I grew up, I snorkeled on the Great Barrier Reef in 1991 um, as a small child, and it, I remember the colors. And I went back and snorkeled again in 2014. I'm like, where are the yeah. What happened? And people are still coming out droves of tourists. Like, this isn't what it's supposed to look like. This isn't right. And so I watched uh, Chasing Coral, that documentary, and about just how the research ran. I actually literally cried. Like, I was just heartbroken. And I think if we can collectively come together, because mourning shouldn't be this thing that you do alone. I mean, of course, everyone mourns alone at times. But if we can come together and have some kind of acknowledgement of what is being lost, acknowledgement of our own complicated feelings of complicity. And when I order something from Amazon, how am I contributing to all of this? And you need to have some kind of rituals of mourning, some kind of acknowledgement of collective loss to then move forward and say what's next. And I think as long as we're sort of saying, I can't mourn because that would be giving up. I, I can't, or other people are saying, what kind of sentimentalist are you? It's just an animal, it's just a tree, who cares? You know, then, um, you know, we're not going to move forward. Yes. I want to build on what you two have said. Oh, please do. In the 60s, I think, and, and I'm an Ed Psych person, but sociology is close. And I read a sociologist whose name was Bonaro or Bonaro Overstreet. Yeah. And she said, I'm not pronouncing that first name. I never knew. She said, let the stubborn ounces of your weight make a difference. Oh, I like that. So that's what you're doing and Dan is doing and really everyone here. And then the last thing is at Hastings College Arboretum, we have hundreds of, and Dan has helped with that, 
hundreds of hours of student service every year, more than big universities, and they will come back someday, many, and say, oh, I helped plant that bur oak, <laughs> mm -hmm. or I helped with the rain garden, or I transplanted pollinators. So this, everybody does a little bit is all we can do. And I don't know if that makes a revolution or a renaissance, but it can make a difference. So I don't think it's totally lost. During Reagan administration, they had a secretary of interior named James Watt. How many of you remember? And he basically took the Bible and science and said, oh, it's all here for us to use up. It was just cataclysmic. Yeah. And before this is before my time, but I heard that Nixon's the one who started the EPA. Right. That's, and, that is interesting. And that things, so <laughs> sometimes things get better. Rivers yeah. were more polluted. The air was worse. It's yeah. the old pictures of like Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, and so something happened. And of course, over the decades, they've been stripping away and stripping away. Yeah. Government regulations are bad. But it does mean that things can get terrible and people can do stuff. The other success story is yeah. the whole in ozone, which growing up in Australia also, like we oh. had the whole like sun smart education was a huge thing in Australia because you get the skin cancer so much more easily. And everyone just said, oh my God, we're making this hole in the ozone. We're all going to die. And they banned CFCs. And it actually happened across the world. And the ozone is now sort of healing to a certain extent. So mass action can happen. Question is, will it happen? Yeah, right. And and quickly I, enough. oh, go ahead. And quickly, enough. and quickly, and it needs to. And I just think there are, there are things that are going to be lost that will not come back in our lifetime. Yeah. But already we're living. It's important to remember also we're for native people, for indigenous peoples, they've already lived in apocalypse for several hundred years now. Yes. You know, the apocalypse already happened to them, and they're living in a post-apocalyptic uh, world. So I think there's something to learn to learn there. But I would like to hold on to hope. I, my final message for you guys would be. There is hope. There is hope. And we have to keep yeah. trying. We can't let the people who are obsessed with death and profit win. I think yeah. we need to see every moment of beauty in this world and uh, you know, make a spiritual practice out of that. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.